Hello everyone, today is Thursday, October 26, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all of you for being here, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I appreciate that. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, some interesting developments there, and we'll drill down into some sector action too. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep your questions to what's on the slides while we're on the slides. But towards the end of the presentation, the end of my presentation, I'll open it up for everything. Once we get to the actual markets, feel free to ask questions about anything. Your favorite stock picks. The only thing I ask there, and this is for your benefit, is ask about one at a time and also wait until we get to the live charts because otherwise your stock pick might get buried in the other questions and also one stock pick per line that way i'll know which ones are covered and which ones i have not and again that's for your benefit so what are we talking about well i see a lot of familiar faces here so it's going to be a little bit of a redundancy deja vu all over again but last week i forgot to hit record so we're going to try doing a take two here today and it's kind of a bummer, too, because I got a lot of good emails. I got more feedback last week than I probably had all year. And you know me, I tend to go off on these rants. So hopefully I can remember what rants I was on last week and recreate them. I guess before I do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That comes from Greg Morris. So... Lately, I've been talking about the two U's. There's the U before the trade, and then there's the U after the trade. And they're two completely different U's. And as I've been saying, before the trade, there's some optimism, there's that wild enthusiasm. And then during the trade, you find yourself occasionally hoping. And before the trade, there's excitement. And then during the trade, there's often boredom. There's excitement like, hey, this stock might go up 100%. And then you watch it over the next three, four weeks do absolutely nothing. And this is an actual trade, by the way. I think the stock went up a couple hundred percent, if memory serves. There's enthusiasm and excitement, as I said a second ago. But then once you're in the trade, there tends to be fear. There's promise. And then there's reality. There's a reality that that promise might not materialize. Everything is known on the left side of the chart. By the way, as I often say, if you find a broker that will let you trade off the left side of the chart, please let me know. By left side, I mean like over here, way over here. But everything is known from this point backwards in the trade. But as soon as you make that trade, you step into the unknown. There's a lot of logic on the left-hand side of the trade. You could see that this was a persistent trend. It was an accelerating trend. Some of these things we're going to talk about later in the presentation. And then there was a very nice trend knockout move. If you go to my website under videos, I have a video on TKOs so you can learn about the pattern. Somewhat of a textbook type of pattern in this particular case. But the logic quickly becomes emotions. As Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So we're going to talk a lot about planning in just a few minutes and how to make that a little bit easier. But it's true. And it's hard not to be biased if you have an actual position. In several presentations I've done in more recent times, I talked about how did you react, how stressful was the bear market from 2016, 2017 in Cocoa? Well, none of you had any stress whatsoever in that bear market. And the reason is because none of you actually were trading it or were long, especially long in this particular case. So by not being an active participant, it didn't bother you. Well, my whole point about that was that fear 
does not exist in the market. It, it exists within you, and it is created by you and only you. Now, on the left side is statistical. I am a discretionary trader, and I use discretion in my analysis. But if you look at a chart like this, you could see that there is persistency, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Now, persistency means the market tends to go up day after day. And mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression. So you could put a linear regression on here. You could measure the move. You could see the moves accelerating. It's very statistical in nature. But once you get in the trade, markets often become irrational and not make a whole lot of sense. There's obviously certainty on the left-hand side of the trade. And as I often say, when there is certainty or conditions aren't changing, everything is static and certain, then your stress is going to be a lot less. But when you step into that unknown and everything becomes uncertain, all of a sudden stress begins to go up. So, again, everything's static on the left side and then once you step into the trade everything begins to change and again when information begins to change or is uncertain stress goes up and that's been proven and that's I'm trying to think of the guy's name I had to clean my office so all my books I tend to have be surrounded by a bunch of books and I just grab them and then I <laughs> pick them all up real quick if somebody comes over so it doesn't look completely uh, disorganized but I probably first read it in uh, something from Montier, so I'll give him credit. But he um, he quotes a lot of other people, too. And he talked about how, again, when you're, when information is certain and unchanging, your stress is going to be much, much, much lower. In fact, the, the as I often say during the planning process, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, I, I actually find it fun. I, I enjoy doing that analysis. It's like being on a treasure hunt. I get a big cup of coffee and just kind of pound away at my little keyboard, kind of like the rat going for the cocaine, you know, hitting a little, just banging on that little space bar, going through as many charts as possible. I actually begged a, a, a chart provider. It's like, can you just give me a space bar feature like I have over here? This is why I'm so addicted to this particular charting software because I could just bang out a thousand charts, two thousand charts pretty darn quickly. So I propose the question, why do we obsess during the trade? Well, I think I just touched upon some of those reasons from a psychological and it actually is also from a physiological standpoint because different parts of our brain act differently and we actually are usually different parts of our brains. Time and time again, I get emails from people asking me what to do with a trade. Now, I'm not talking about someone who's new to the methodology. That's understandable. We all have to learn somewhere. But this is from a lot of people who are a lot more seasoned and obviously, they didn't have a plan going into the trade. So one of the things that I've recently learned, one of my epiphanies, is that, as I just said, different parts of the brain are actually used. And I started, as I've said quite often, I started a psychology course about three years ago. And I ended up with a 14-page to-do list of things that I wanted to research and cover. And at that point, I realized that it's probably too massive of a project to get done within any reasonable time frame. So I scrapped it and ended up doing uh, the Trading Full Circle course, which ended up taking me two years to do. But a lot of that psycho psychology research that I did leading up to that, making that to-do list and realizing how much more I had to do, was was not uh, it done in a fruition it was it was done in um is that the right word it wasn't done in vain i guess a lot of that found its way into the trading full circle course and then now it's kind of like that's kind of my launching pad 
to take it to one step further and go back and revisit all these things that I wanted to cover. And it's like each day, it's amazing how it just keeps unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. And I'll get to some of the things I, I read just this week working on the course. But the point I have, believe it or not, I have one, is that through this process, I keep having these epiphanies because I'm thinking like, why, why is trading so hard? And more specifically, why is it so damn hard to follow the plan? Because I'm in here dropping F-bombs and getting upset and getting aggravated and then feeling a little low now and then. Yesterday, for instance, got stopped out, got aggravated, got frustrated, had a client not happy. Well, I'm not happy either. I feel your pain. So it could be very frustrating and sometimes it could be quite lonely. But the more I learn about the psychology, the easier it becomes. It's not becoming any it's not becoming easy, but it's becoming easier. And I learned many years ago that I just have to do the hard thing even though it feels unnatural. And like I said a second ago, it can feel lonely. Well, I just read recently in Dixon Watts' book, I've been going back and reading these, these books that deal a lot with trading psychology going back many, many years. Because I want to, it's like I want to give proper credit where credit is due. And it's kind of interesting. I'll quote somebody to more modern text. And then I'll later read where somebody said it 100 years prior in some of these older books on technical analysis. And even uh, even in Livermore's Reminiscences of a Stock Operator said in that book, he said, there's nothing new under the sun, which is obviously a quote that comes from the Bible, which was written a little bit before Livermore's time. And it's kind of interesting to go through all these these older texts on trading psychology and to pick up so many of these little thoughts. And I just thought this was kind of an interesting one. In his secret heart, every man thinks the universe is especially hard on him. And lately, when I have some hard times or things don't go my way, just like last night, some situa a situation didn't go my way, and I was pretty bummed out about it. And I'm just like, okay, well, people are dying in the world. You know, <laughs> is, is your problem really that big? And it just kind of helps you to put things in perspective but this is a very good quote in the secret heart every man thinks the universe is especially hard on him and applied to trading it's like why is it so hard to trade is it just me and i like a challenge and i think that's probably what sucked me into the trading field 20 something years ago it's almost 30 years now it's kind of scary wow but anyway i like the challenge and I think I would have gotten bored a long time ago. I kind of got bored with programming early on back in my programming days. I was thinking there's got to be more life than this. Nothing wrong with programming. I still enjoy doing a little bit here and there if I'm working on a system or something, something I haven't really done in a few years. But if I'm working on some sort of analysis where I might want to program something in just to just to get an idea of what's happening. I still enjoy it, but in bits and pieces, not as uh, not all day, every day. Anyway, before I digress too far, I know too late. It can be a lonely sport, but the more you learn about the psychology of it and the physiology of our brains, the easier and easier it becomes, and, and it becomes more of this epiphany where you accept things so lately i still get pissed off i still drop the f-bombs but i'm like dave this is perfectly normal the way you're feeling as long as you did the best going in to the trade then and you followed the process of course then it is what it is, and sometimes, and sometimes more than sometimes, markets just don't cooperate. But this epiphany that I've really taken the ball and ran with, and hopefully I got my tense right on that. I'm sure I'll get emails. 
but it came from steam barge and i wrote about this recently and i've mentioned this in several of the recent webinars and last week of course because this is a redo but he said people lose money in the markets because the person who places a trade very often is not the same person who manages and closes the trade quite literally another self has taken over another mind and if you kind of go back to that slide two slides ago before and during the trade you're actually using different parts of your brain and the hard part is you're going to, going to be more emotional now all decisions have emotions and i beat the dead horse on that quite a bit any decision what even what you're going to have for lunch today has emotions attached but when you're in the trade your decisions can become more emotionally charged and you can end up using a very small much smaller part of your brain or certainly not all of your brain you'll end up using the more primal parts of your brain that deal with the four f's let's see if i can remember them fear food fight and there's another one f oh fortification and those much smaller parts of your brain and or emotional parts of your brain take over. And as I wrote in my latest column on my website, the best thing you can do when you do get emotional like that, and it's not hard, you're doing it right now anyway, but breathe, take a deep breath, okay? And then you want to, you want to bypass that amygdala which only takes about i forget exactly how much but it, it's less than three seconds to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there i have a little uh clock a little um i got it in my hands right now i don't know if you could hear it i got a little clock that i bought kind of symbolism little airline uh vintage airline clock i wrote about greg morris a while back and when faced with a situation in the similar simulators where they try to trick you up when you're in an F-16 or F-4, I guess back then it was F-4s. He's in an F-4 simulator and they try to trick you up, lights and bells and whistles and all these things going off. They try to freak you out so you crash the simulator by making some emotionally charged mistake. Well, Greg wasn't immune to this psychological experiment that they did with everyone and he knew that if he was going to become a fighter pilot, he was going to have to figure out a way to, to not get caught up in all this emotionally. And what he figured out that he could do was just to, when all, everything kind of, you know, the, the shit hit the fan, so to speak, he figured out that if he just wound the clock, you know, so wind the clock when things get kind of crazy. So I, I try to make a habit of before placing a trade to actually grab that stupid little clock on my desk and wind the clock. And then Greg said in more in, when he was in a fighter pilot, he did a fighter plane. He did the same thing in these uh, scary situations. And later, he, when he was a commercial airline pilot, by then I, there the clocks the clocks were electronic. There was no clock to wind, but he would just kind of physically pretend to wind the clock so he could process the information using his whole brain so keep in mind that that little amygdala down in the limbic part of your brain down in that that 4f part of your brain can it keeps you alive and you have to embrace and love that part but it can also really screw up your trades because it's going to make you take an emotionally charged type of trade so sometimes it, you only need a few seconds and I think one of the examples that was used in one of these behavioral finance books was Gmail for a while put in a retraction where you can retract the emails after you sent them within so many seconds and it's not that it didn't work the fact that it was just the opposite it was, I forget the exact numbers, but an overwhelming number. The majority of all emails were retracted, and they ended up removing the feature. And that's because you, you do something in an emotionally charged state, 
And then when you remove yourself from that state a few seconds later, might be all it takes, you begin to use the rest of what's sloshing around up there. An example I gave in my column and talked about in Trading Full Circle and often mentioned is try this with your spouse or significant other. And by the way, it's probably not a good idea to have both. <laughs> Somebody told me recently, I, was, I, I had supper with Dick Fruth over the weekend, and he was telling me about some technician. And <laughs> at his funeral, the two wives met, which I thought was uh, kind of interesting, some famous technician, but I guess I shouldn't gossip. But anyway, where was I? <laughs> um, so the next time you feel like having a quick, quick snap back, with your spouse or significant other, then count to three, okay? And if you still respond after that in an inappropriate way, then it probably was necessary. And my wife was kind of shocked when I told her, I was like, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I, she's like, why don't you do that? I'm like, oh my God, you don't, you don't know how many times I have done that and how much it saved my butt. I'm not perfect just yet, but I, at, at that particular part, right? But I'm learning. I'm trying to, like, take that breath and wait a second. And that'll make your life a lot easier. Well, in a trade, do the same thing. Make sure you take a breath. Make sure you really want to do what you're going to do. Go back in and look at your actual plan. Now, as I preach, if you get better before, during a trade, before doing a trade, you're going to get better while you're actually in the trade. Now, I know it's cliche, but you need to pick the best and leave the rest. What was it, Market Wizards? They talked about you got to be really careful to distinguish between intuition, which I think plays a vital role in everything we do. And I touch upon that in my latest column, so check that out. And into wishing. In other words, hoping something will happen or trying to make something happen in less than ideal conditions. Now, I've kind of been beating a dead horse on this. I'm getting tired of myself. <laughs> I'm getting tired of it myself. But garbage in, garbage out. I learned that quickly in my computer science days that you can't write crappy code and expect some kind of miracle to occur in the process. A computer is only going to do exactly what you tell it to do but it's true the better more carefully well thought and i'm going to run through a few of these things in just one second but the better your trade is going in your better the better your trade is going to be in the actual trade <laughs> I would say solution for dropping F bombs. Drink two or three abitas and chill, a substitute drink of choice. Well, yeah, I'd be an alcoholic if I drank two or three beers to try to avoid an F bomb. As I often preach, Papa John would probably make a good trader. And as Papa John says, better ingredients, better pizzas. Now, here are a few things to obsess upon before the trade. Proper stock selection is vitally important. It took me 14 hours to cover what I thought needed to be covered. In other words, everything I know about stock selection. But there's a few things that I can give you that can put you well upon your way. In fact, the things we're going to look at right now, if you if you watch the older Dave Landry's The Week in Charts, the reason I say that is most everybody now is like up to speed that comes to the live shows. But if you watch some of the older Week in Charts, you'll see these things that I'm showing you over the next few slides are stuff that comes up all the time. It's like, hey, Dave, you like this? What do you like? Do you like this stock? I'm like, no, because of this. But when it comes to stock selection, one of the best things you can do is study select, study success, easy for me to say, and deliberate practice. If you go to 
my website, and this is the uh, current article I keep referring to, by the way. I need to work on my titling of these things. Why following the trading plan is hard and six steps that you can take to make that easy. But if you come here and do a search on deliberate practice, you'll see that this is something that I have written about fairly extensively. It's going to bring up this first article on the home page. But if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see there's quite a few, there's 20 other articles where I mention it. So check these out at your leisure. But delivered practice is very important. So by studying success as part of deliberate practice, what I'm saying is if you see a stock that makes a large move, ask yourself, could you have caught that move or should you have caught that move? Now, you have to remember that you can't kiss all the women unless you're Harvey Weinstein, and then that will eventually come back to haunt you, as he has learned. <laughs> So I would encourage you to go in and study success. Find stocks that have taken off. When you're going through your charts every night and you see a stock that made a big move, say, okay, well, was there one of my patterns there? Now, again, you can't kiss all the women, so don't try to trade every methodology in every market. You'll end up chasing your own tail. That I can guarantee you. But if you find something simple and stick with it, and for me, it's mostly pullbacks or pullback related patterns, with the exception of a couple of little breakout things that we do in the IPOs. But most of what I do is just trading pullbacks. And that's one thing that I'm actually working on in this course for psychology is that you really need to specialize. And I think it was Linda Rasky or someone, I'll give Rasky credit for it because I think she mentioned it. But there's someone who all he trades is soybeans and all he trades is soybeans on the long side. And he's a very successful trader, but he's narrowed his focus down to one market, to one side of the market. And that's all he does. Well, for me, it's it's pullbacks. If I had to. In a nutshell, tell you what I do. Sum it all up. But go in and when you see these stocks that make these big moves. Just say, okay, could I have caught that move or should I have caught that move? And in some cases, the market will just take off without some sort of discernible pattern. Now, in the case of our biggest winner so far this year, we had a nice long base. There was a nice persistent move higher where it went up 80%. And then it had a TKO, a trend knockout on a wide range bar down. Now, if you were just seeing this stock today, back the chart out until it took off and see if there was some sort of pattern that could have gotten you in, something that you actually trade. And if you're looking at a couple thousand stocks a day, every day like I am, and in the back of your mind you're thinking, okay, could I have caught that move or should I have caught that move? You're going to get better and better at picking better and better stocks. And it's, it's a counterfeit currency detective argument that I often make. Counterfeit currency detectives, they don't go in and study a bunch of crappy bills. As I often say, they don't get a little monopoly a uh, $500 orange bill and go, oh, yeah, this one's fake. No. Or a bill with $3 bill with Bill Clinton on it. And, oh, this one's fake, too. <laughs> no, they study the genuine article. And they learn inside and out everything there is to know about how that dollar is made. And they know they're so used to looking at such perfection into every little thing, and they're probably seeing a lot more things that we even know about in the in the uh, real currency, that a fake just jumps out at them and looks obvious. And as I often say, the best setups tend to jump out at me. And they will 
they'll do the same thing with you too. Now, if you had to break it down, and again, it took me 14 hours to cover everything that I know about stock selection, but there's just a few little things that will put you long on your way and certainly will keep you from fighting the trend and trading stocks that look like electrocardiograms. And one of the things I'll have to talk about, and this is a qualifier, it's not quantifying, we're not trying to reduce it down to some sort of equation. Early in my career, I was encouraged to, if I wrote about something, I was encouraged to back it up with some sort of fixed indicator or statistics or, or whatever. And inadvertently, I put too much emphasis on ADX, and it's taken me 20 years to kind of like not wean myself from ADX, but kind of distance myself from using ADX or any other type of trend, quantitative type of trend, uh, what do you want to call it, indicator. But I think you can qualify trends by looking for certain characteristics, looking for these certain good characteristics and trend, looking for these genuine characteristics, such as the counterfeit currency, detective looking at the genuine characteristics of real money and I've dubbed these trend qualifiers and the way I define that is daily and multi-day bar patterns that help to determine the quality of the trend now one good thing to look for would be demand days now demand days or when a stock closes strongly it tends to open towards the low of the day and by the end of the day it closes nice and strong so that means that there is some buying coming in during the day and also people are willing to hold into the close and there's certainly not any selling or if there is any selling it's being absorbed because the close is on the high of the bar. People wanted to buy that stock up until the last bit of the close. Now, gaps in the direction of the trend are another good characteristic. Now, you'll often, people will often show me a stock in these webinars and say, well, what do you think about this stock? It was like, well, it's got a 100% gap. It doubled overnight. And that creates such a disequilibrium that, it, it should be tossed out. There's nothing you could do with that. But by a gap in the direction of the trend, I'm talking about something kind of reasonable, something that looks like what I have here on the chart, where a stock closes at one point on one day and then gaps higher on the next. To those who are a little newer to trading, a gap is just a gap in the chart. It's just that. Laps are also important. Now, a lap is where the stock opens higher on the following day but it's not higher than the prior day's high the gap overlaps the prior price bar as you can see here and that's why they're called a gap short for i guess like overlap now wide range bars in the direction of the trend are important Again, within reason, if it goes up 100% in one day, that's a little too crazy. There's a pattern I call a bottle rocket. I don't know if I have a slide on that, but a bottle rocket is when a stock shoots up two or 300% over a couple days and then comes right back in. It's very hard for a market to sustain such a ridiculously parabolic type of move. But wide range bar just means that the bar is wider than the recent bars. So if the stock normally has a one or two point range and all of a sudden you see a five point range higher, in other words, in the direction of the trend, we're talking about uptrends, right? Then it helps to qualify that trend. Now here's a big one, acceleration versus deceleration. And again, if you come to enough of these shows, especially the older shows, you'll notice that a lot of people ask about stocks that are decelerating in trend. By accelerating, I mean that if you drew a trend line under the bars, you would have to turn that trend line a little higher 
as opposed to deceleration in trend where the trend line begins to flatten out. Now, it doesn't mean the chart on the right is going to roll over tomorrow, but it does mean that the market is losing a little steam. And again, you want to obsess before you go into a trade and not afterwards. And if you think about it, once you're in a trade, there's really not much to do. And that's why I talked about it a lot in a recent article. By doing nothing, you could let the position unfold. Margin call. <laughs> Don't answer it. Like, as I said, it's kind of like a repeat of last week. Why don't you just turn your phone off? Yeah, because I remember three weeks later to turn it back on. <laughs> but I forget anyway uh, to turn it off. You want to make sure as many pieces fit going in. And one of those, obviously, would be make sure that trend's accelerating and not decelerating. Now, along the lines of accelerating versus decelerating and keeping it simple and one of the most common problems that I see with people who are new to picking stocks or people who are been around for a while and are trying to make something happen trying to force the issue because in their real life they sort of force the issue to make things happen they get up early to go to work they work hard and they make it happen. Well, in trading, you have to do all that, but you don't always have to take action. So obviously you want to ask yourself, is the market higher, lower, or about the same as it was? Now, a lot of you, your eyes are glazing over, like, well, duh. But then when we get to the stock picking part, you're going to ask me about a stock that went sideways for three months. I guess you probably won't now because I told you not to. <laughs> but you really have to ask yourself, what's the net net change? And if you didn't know anything about technical analysis, just that in and of itself would keep you out of a lot of trouble. It would certainly keep you in uptrends when the market's going higher, downtrends when it's going lower, and out of new positions when it's going sideways. So again, you don't want to forget about the net-net. So here we have a deceleration in trend that we talked about in a minute ago. And if you look at the net-net over a longer period of time, it looks pretty impressive because the market ran up substantially. In fact, you could draw one of those famous big blue arrows that I'm always, always talking about. But if you look over the shorter to intermediate term, you could see that the stock has gone mostly sideways. Not only has it lost momentum, but it's relatively unchanged over the past several weeks to a month. So net-net is important both shorter term and longer term. Longer term is great. The market's higher. And obviously sometimes you have these long consolidations. Now, that doesn't mean you should exit your position. When they lose acceleration, it might just be consolidating. But again, you want to obsess before you go into a trade and not afterwards. So you want to make sure you have perfection going in. Once you get into the trade, I guarantee you, you're not going to have perfection. Even on these great trades that I've been showing that have gone up tremendously, most of the time the positions are going against us, back and get filling. Even though they're up 300% longer term since we got in, a lot of the time in the trade was spent backing and filling or giving up open profits. And sometimes, like the one I showed earlier, it was at a loss for a month or so before it actually took off. That's okay because we're going to just follow our plan. And not to get into it too much, but micromanagement is probably the biggest sin that I see. And that's and the more successful you are, the harder it is going to be not to micromanage because you feel like you have to do something. You're a person of action. Micromanagement means you're going to get out at the first signs of adversity. And if you do that, you'll never catch a trend. Or the old Wall Street adage, you can't go broke by taking a profit. Well, that's true, but you're never going to catch 
a decent gain. You're never going to pay for, I need to come up with an eloquent way of saying it, but you're never going to pay for your losing trades if you don't catch an occasional big winner as a trend follower. Now, maybe there's other methods out there where you could take little small profits, but I have issues with those type of methods and not enough time to get into it today, but you got to be very careful. And I haven't figured out a way otherwise, other than you have to make sure you keep your losses limited and have the potential for unlimited gains. Otherwise, you'll never pay for all your losses because something bad could still happen even short, even with short-term trading. And the problem there is, I don't want to digress too far, but I've, I've got a lot of experience with this stuff. And I've seen stuff work for 20 years and then blow up. I know, it's crazy. So you might fall into something and think you have something, some reversions to the mean type trading or something like that, naked options or whatever. And it might work for a while, but you're, what's the old adage? I guess you're picking up nickels in front of a bulldozer. Now, as I often preach persistency, getting back to the trade qualifiers, is very important. And mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression. With persistency, the market tends to go up day after day after day after day after day. And you could draw a trend line through most, if not all, of the bars. And in some cases, if the bars are above the trend line or you have some above the trend line, that's even better because it suggests that there's acceleration in the trend or some sort of excitement. It's not only persisting, but it's accelerating. Now, mathematically, again, that's equivalent to linear regression. I think it's a least squared type of deal, but I just prefer to draw a line through as many bars as possible. But if you do get bored, as I often say, you could, um, what do you call them, little thing? Pixie sticks? It looks like pixie sticks. Those little sticks, and I forget, the, there was some little game with these different colored sticks. Um, pixie sticks, is that it? Or is pixie sticks the sugar thing? <laughs> anyway, pick up sticks maybe. There was, uh, if you plot a bunch of different colored ones on a chart, it's really kind of a fun exercise. And that kind of uh, illustrates the net-net change, and it gives you the, the linear regression of different time periods. So you could see that, yes, it's in a longer-term trend, but short to intermediate term, it might be losing steam. Now, again, I prefer to just look at a lot of charts every day, but it, it is a good exercise if you wanted to just kind of mess around with something. I think linear regression is kind of a fun thing to do. <laughs> Dave, I want to party with you. <laughs> All right, here's something else to obsess over. Obsess over the initial stop. And as I've said, a nausea, I couldn't figure out why people won't plan a trade to begin with. And then one day it hit me. As soon as you plan a trade, you have admitted that you could be wrong because in that plan, you have to put what? A protective stop. So here's just a couple things. And obviously, I went into them in a lot more detail than trading full circle, but Ask yourself, how volatile is the underlying instrument? You're not going to use a 2% stop in a stop that's bouncing around 4% a day. Let me, let me just rephrase that in terms of points. If a stock is bouncing around 3, 4, 5 points a day, you're not going to use a $2 stop. I think it was in 1998 or 99, I wrote an article for TradeHard.com where I talked about the myth of tight stops. There's, and, that, and I'm, I'm getting tired of myself saying it, but say, but there was a, there's a popular method out there that says use an 8% stop on all stops. That's like saying we should all wear a medium-sized shirt, something my fat ass hasn't done since I was four years old. Every time I tell a story, I get one year younger. Last time I told it, I was five years old. <laughs> How do you think I got the name Big Dave? I'm working on that, though. I'm down 30 pounds, so that's a start. Uh, but how volatile is the underlying instrument? Now, there's ways you can measure this statistically. 
But for me, I just like to eyeball it. I do put historical volatility on every chart. And when we get to the charts, when you guys start asking about stocks and girls, you'll see that I have the HV on that and I'll make reference to it. In some cases, if a stock is uh, crazy volatile, then we won't trade it. But we do tend to err on the uh, side of more volatile stocks, or, or we like, I should say, that's a bad way of putting it. We tend to like more volatile stocks, better the devil you know. I have a special report on that on my website. If you go down, go to the store, go to the bottom, free reports. I've got a decent article, if I say so myself, on that. I think it was originally published in Traders Magazine, and it was republished into several languages, Germany and Greek even, and a few other ones. Anyway, but it's 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 on there, so check it out. So how volatile is the stock? Now, how long do you want to stay in the position? Now, I am a – I'm slotted as a swing trader, but I'll stay with the position as long as it moves in my favor. So this is kind of a pure swing trade over here. Your stop, if you kind of take time and then go over to the stop, to withstand a short-term – market move based on let's say this volatility up here your stop is going to have to be somewhere in here to withstand a longer term correction and to try to ride a longer term trend your stop's going to have to be much 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 bigger well this is why if you notice we start off with this little swing trade stop and then as we get further and further in position this stop begins to widen now we make that transition and we're taking partial profits along the way and scaling out. So even though this risk is increasing, this is open risk. And as I've said quite a bit, Curtis Faith was talking about Richard Dennis. And Richard Dennis told the Turtles that he felt differently about open risk or risk to open profits versus flat out losses. So Dennis knew it came with the territory. It came with the game, okay? It comes with the territory, I should say, that you're going to have to give up substantial gains somewhere along the way if you're going to profit longer term. And I often show a chart where the stock is up 25% and then up maybe 2% if that much and then up 50% and then up 25% and then up 100% but then only up 75%. And one and then 200 percent, and so on and so forth. And the, the point I'm making is, if you quit at 25 percent, you'll never make 50. You quit at 50, you'll never make 100. You quit at 200, you'll never make 400, and so on and so forth. And as I often say, but Dave, how many times does it go up three? Does it go up 300 percent? Not often, but sometimes that one trade might be your saving grace. And if you can get a few of those a year, you'll do okay. And that's one of the biggest problems that I see with trend following in general, whether it's my methodology or someone else's. And by the way, if you boil them all down, if you are a pure trend follower and you're not doing something arcane, like counting of a wave or something, then you could boil it all down to something really simple. I'm working on an article on, on Dave Light or Daylight. Where just using daylight will help keep you on the right side of the trend. And when some of these people hit it right with some of these arcane methodologies, put in a simple moving average and you'll see that just following the moving average would have done as well or even better than their arcane methodology. Now, I didn't mean to beat up on those guys, but the point I'm trying to make is that when you boil it all down, trend following all sort of begins to look the same. And I think I have a good way of doing it combined with the hybrid approach to money management where you're getting the swing trade out and you're making the transition. And then, of course, you're picking the best and leaving the rest using all these things I just talked about with the qualifiers. But if you boiled it all down, if you're doing a pure trend following, it's going to look a lot like what I'm doing. It, they all kind of look the same. And by the way, you could boil down – nearly any methodology you're either a trend follower or not if you're not a new one better come along you're either if you're a trend follower you're a breakout player or a pullback player or some combination thereof 
And if you're a counter trend trader, then you're trading just reversion to the mean. You're waiting for that market to get stretched and then try to catch that falling knife, which is which will work until it don't. But I don't want to digress too far. Anyway. So where are you going to put that stop? Getting back to the stops. The stop has to be, again, outside the normal noise of the market. I have helped a lot of people over the years. Dave, I'm getting stopped out. I got stopped out 20 times in a row. So, well, let's take a look at your stops. Well, if your stop is somewhere in here, down here for a long or up here for a short, the normal noise of that, mo that market is going to take you out. So a lot of times in these cases, like, you know what, loosen your stop up a little bit. Bring your stop from there to there. And guess what? You'll start catching trends. And that's the thing. If you've been at this for a couple years, or at least a year, let's say, and you truly want to do it, and you truly want to trade trends and follow trends and do the money management and wrap your head around the psychology and accept the fact that it's going to be hard to actually follow the plan like we're talking about today, you'll reach a point where you think you might be so far away from success but you might be just like an inch away. It's kind of like the – reminds me of that 10 feet from gold story where these people bought all this equipment at retail, and then they dug and dug and dug and dug and dug and dug for gold. They had this – it was supposed to be this big gold vein was going to be there, and they gave up, and then they had a wholesale sale of all the equipment. And the people who came out – I don't know if it took them a day or a week or a month or – or five minutes, but they went to whatever, however long it takes to go 10 feet. They went 10 feet more and they found one of the biggest gold veins in the history of the United States. It's 10 feet from gold. It's like, don't give up. Now, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. But as long as what you're doing is sound and you are following the trend, not fighting the trend, and you do it for around a year, and you're still not successful, I'd be willing to bet only a minor tweak is necessary. And the reason I'm off on this tangent is because I've helped a lot of people by telling them, loosen your stops a little bit. Now, adjust your share size down accordingly, but just loosen up your stops a little bit if you're getting stopped out a lot. The, other, the flip side of that is maybe your stock selection could use a little bit of help. So, again, you must survive the short-term volatility. Now, there's not enough time to go through every scenario here, but I thought this is a really easy one to show you. You have to ask yourself, where would you be wrong? Okay. Now, by the way, all of this, everything I'm talking about now is before the trade. So, obsess before the trade. You have relatively unlimited amount of time. You have it from the market's close until the next open to figure all this out. And that should be plenty of time. And by the way, as I often say, and, and I said in the most recent column, one way to get through life, and it's worked for me so far, knock on wood, if you don't know what to do, then say, self, I don't know what to do. But if I did know what to do, this is what I would do. I don't know where to place my stop. And in more recent years, I've been telling people, look, Ask me a question, but give me your best answer before, and then we'll go from there. That way you'll learn. Because if I tell you, give me the answer, you really haven't learned anything. But give me the answer first. So ask yourself, okay, Dave, I don't know where to place a stop, but if I did know where to place a stop, it would probably go here because the stock bounces around three or four points a day. I'm right at about six points on my stop. That should be enough for normal volatility. What do you think? And then my, my answer in email becomes easier. Yes. <laughs> you got it. So you got to ask yourself, where would you be wrong? Now, in a case like this, there's some cases where, like a generic pullback, it's a little tougher on a generic pullback, and it will take a little experience to know where you're, where you're wrong. But in a case of a first... Pull back after a base breakout. By the way, this is a good pattern to trade, by the way. In fact, that's you got Kemet was one of those. 
Uh, by that, I mean a first pullback after a base breakout, you have a base and a stock. And as I often preach, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch in the space. If you've got a big, long base and the stock begins to take off, look to trade that first little pullback that occurs, okay? Now, say you do get triggered into a situation like this, and the stock comes all the way back to its prior range. Well, you know you're wrong, so your stop should be somewhere in here, depending on the size of the breakout. If this is a massive breakout, then maybe it'll be a little bit higher so you know that's failed because it's likely going back to the prior range. But if it comes back all the way back into the prior range, you know that you are wrong. <laughs> I have a Make America Great hat printed in Russian, and I'm not sure who it offends, but I just think it's the funniest thing. And I forget, sometimes I'll have it on, don't feel like a, you know, in a hurry, run out the house, throw the hat on. And somebody would be checking me out, and they'd be like, what does that say? Is that make America great in Russian? <laughs> anyway, I think it's hilarious. I think I like it because it's equally offensive, you know. You can take it any way you want. All right. Uh, obsess over where you're going to enter in the trade. As I often say, a lot of times a textbook entry will get you in trouble. And that means that you're going to enter right above the prior day's high. And a lot of times a market maker is going to take that stock up. Trigger you in and then bring it right back down. Suck you in and spit you out. In more modern times, I've used more and more wiggle room. Now, there's a trade-off, obviously, between enough wiggle room and too much. If you're up here, obviously, then you're a breakout player, and that's a whole different type of trading. Remember, as a pullback trader, we're trying to capture that reversion to the mean move, that bounce in the direction of the trend. And hopefully, I know I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully – that bounces enough to get the stock started toward that initial profit target, or maybe the bounce in and of itself is enough. The noise alone of the bounce is enough to get you a partial profit on a trade. But in more recent times, I've been giving them a little bit more wiggle room, and this has kept me out of a lot of losing positions. Not all of them. There's one that I often show where we had nice little wiggle room up here, and this stock went like right up here, and then came right back in. Just enough to trigger you in. It happens. Spell with a silent SH. So obsess over where you're gonna enter the trade. We've already obsessed over we were already obsessed over picking the best. We're already obsessed over where you're gonna enter. And then we've already obsessed over where you're gonna place a stop. So then you need to obsess over the rest of the plan. And remember. You're drinking your cup of coffee or green tea or water or Coke or whatever, whatever your favorite poison is. And you're relaxed and there's not a whole lot of stress involved in the planning phase. Early in, the tr early in your career, yes, you're not sure where to get in and exactly where to place to stop and all these other things. But you'll get better and better with that. That I can promise. So... The rest of the plan is how are you going to trail that stop higher? And again, we start out with a fairly tight stop, and then as it moves more and more in our favor, we kind of loosen it up. Now, I haven't quantified this, but if you did want to quantify it, if you'll notice when I draw these trailing stops in on the charts, they kind of take on the appearance of a longer-term moving average. And I'll throw out a little possible system here. Let's say you get in a trade. We'll maybe have like a 20-day moving average as a stop, which in some cases that might be a little tight, so it might have to be a little bit long, longer term. But let's just for argument's sake, say you start off with a 20-day moving average and then you let that stop widen by increasing the length of that moving average. I think that could probably be a system in and of itself. And if you boil down what I'm doing, it probably looks a lot like that, that loosening of the stop. But I prefer, as I often say, to like play games to loosen that stop up. Games such as what I call keep the change. Market goes up a few cents. I leave the stop where it is. Or let's say a market goes up 46 cents. I might raise the stop 40 cents. And then I've let that stop widen out really gradually. And that's not too painful, that few cents at a time. But that can add up over time and help you make that transition to the longer term trend follower by doing that. And then the other thing I like to do is let's say you have like a three-point move one day. Well, then bump your stop up two points. I call that gaining ground. Well, you, you've made, if stopped out boring overnight gaps, you've made an additional two points on that trade. 
Now, you're going to have to give up some profits in the end, but at least you're two points ahead of the game. All right, a couple other things to obsess about real quick, and then we're going to jump into the charts here in just one second. So as I just said, how are you going to make that transition? Those two things that I said, keep the change and then gaining ground, use that to make your transition to the longer-term trend follower. Now, the, the paradox of trading is it's so hard because it's so easy. Dave, I thought you said it wasn't easy. No, it's not easy, but is it really that hard? Is it really that hard to follow the plan? Yes, but no, stay with me. If you, if there's nothing to do, then what do you do? Well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty simple thing. Nothing. I was thinking right before I went live this morning, what if you hired a kid and paid a minimum wage and taught him a little bit about what's going on. We wouldn't take a whole lot of instruction. Just say, okay, look, I've got this alert set. When this alert dings, you need to do this. If this alert goes off, you need to exit this trade and give them a set of rules to follow. In the meantime, you can play with your phone you can play video games. You can call your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever your preference may be. I guess nowadays it could be both. <laughs> call your wife or girlfriend, but not both. Do whatever you want. And as a trader I met once who had a system he couldn't follow because it was too stressful, he told the guy, Follow the system. You don't follow, you're gonna get fired. Well, the guy don't. The guy doesn't care. He's not like the boxer getting punched in the face trying to execute a plan. He's just trying to keep his job. But if you think about that analogy, if you had a kid and you gave him a plan and paid him a, a nominal amount of money to follow the plan, and you would fire him if he didn't, he would probably. Do okay. You would do okay as a trader because that plan will get followed and executed. The problem is you get emotionally involved. We all do. We all drop. Well, I'm sure some of you ladies in here don't, but <laughs> a lot. Every trader I ever met drops an F bomb. I went, I, the lady trader I once met within the first 10 seconds of meeting her, she dropped an F bomb. I'm like, wow, that was quick. <laughs> you know, uh, we all tend to get a little emotional in our trading and that's just human nature there's nothing we can do about that or is there well you can walk away from your screens so the hard thing is to walk away from your screens but is it really that hard no just do it i think alerts work out great i keep coming back to this column because it's still fresh in my head but recently i was in a stock and it's just a piece of crap and every day I look at it and it just makes me more and more angry that it's going the wrong way. And then finally I said, screw it. I just put in a hard, I forget what I did. No, I put an alert in because I didn't want to use a stop. It was kind of thin. So I'll put an alert in and I literally forgot about it. I took it off my screen and I forgot that I was still long. And I got an email. It was a strange email. I thought it was spam at first because I haven't uh, used these, these particular alerts in a while. I'm like, what the heck is this? It's like, oh. That stock is approaching the stop, the STOP, so I need to exit. So I just went in and exited, and I felt great. After I was like, thank God that's over. But if I would have kept watching that stock for the next week or so, I would have put myself into that negative state of mind. And I don't want to go too freshman psychology and holistic on you, but you do have to, as I go more and more into this, you do have to take a holistic approach and anything that's making you negative could keep you from seeing the positive. In other words, if I'm angry because the stock is going against me, then it's possible that I might miss the next big opportunity. As I think I wrote in layman's during the great bull market of 99 and a broker friend. And we often were in a lot of same trades together. And I pointed out some stocks, that I was in or some stocks we maybe talked about together. 
and I was having a pretty good run. And I'm like, well, did you get this stock? No. Did you take this stock? No. It, it, like three or four positions. And I'm like, well, why not? And he says, oh, I'm busy nursing some positions. It's like, you know, kind of reminds me of the, was it Meet the Fockers? You know, you can nurse anything with nipples. It's like, well, I don't know. Can you? Can you? What does that mean, nursing some positions? Either you're stopped out or you're not. If you're not, then go find another opportunity, okay? And if you're stopped out, then get out. Mind sculpting can be useful. I think it's Ian Robinson wrote the book called Mind Sculpting. I'd recommend you read that. Um, as I said earlier in the presentation, it's like the more I study this, the more I learn, the more and more I learn about things that make more and more sense. And I'm, I'm trying to think of the word for it. It's a, is it, you have a neuron, which is like a, a, a wire that connects your brain, parts of your brain to other parts of your brain. And then there's this myelin on top of it, which is like wire insulation. And they never really understood how it worked and what the whole thing was. And there's a paper called Why White Matter Matters. And they re never really thought the white matter of our brain was that important, but come to find out it is. And that's where a lot of our learning is. And that's, that's where a lot of our getting set in our ways. And the reason what happens is, and I hope I'm not butchering the words here because I just read this yesterday or day before, but they call it a myelinated sheath where this myelin builds up around the wire, so to speak. It's kind of like a – think of electrical wire with, with uh, insulation on the outside. Well, as that myelinated sheath gets bigger and bigger, that pathway could be 100 to 150 times faster than that neuron that doesn't have that myelinated sheath. Now, I might be mixing up things a little bit. The, the wire, I think, is, is, the, is it the axon or neuron? I forget. But anyway, you get the idea. The wire is in your brain. So what's interesting about that is if you, if you learned anything in this presentation today or you watch somebody else's YouTube or read somebody else's article, whatever, what's interesting is, and there's some TED Talks on this too, it's kind of interesting, is your brain is physically different after you learn something than it was before. Now, it's a little harder to learn as you get older. For instance, like I struggled with learning Italian. I'm still, obviously, I'm not, I'm not fluent, but I could, I could bump around in Italy if I had to. I can get by, you know. I could say I want food and things like that. But the more you learn, the more you, you, you get these pathways develop. And, and somehow, and sometimes that's how we get set in our ways. And undoing is a little bit tougher because when you're younger, you don't have as many of these these uh, myelinated sheaths that are happening. So before I dig myself too much of a hole, all I'm trying to say here is that you can mind sculpt the trade by saying, okay, I'm going to imagine the stock triggers and I'm going to get in. Or I'm going to imagine that it doesn't trigger and I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to imagine that it triggers and then stops me out, and I'm going to take that stop. I'm going to imagine that it triggers and then rallies up to that initial profit target, and I'm going to take those partial profits, and I'm going to bump that stop higher. And I'm going to imagine that the trend keeps going, and I'm going to imagine myself loosening up that stop. So after you make your plan, imagine all these things happen. If, if you can't follow your plan, then imagine all these things happening. Imagine yourself dropping an F-bomb, but then turning your screen off and walking away, placing an alert. So do the mind sculpting ahead of time. And mind sculpting is a very fascinating thing. And I think it was in uh, Robertson's book where he talked about, like, the Olympic athlete broke a leg or whatever. And if you compare him to another athlete that broke a leg and sat around and played video games, as opposed to sat around and mentally meditated on jumping the ski slopes, or whatever their field was, the recovery times are much more, dramatically much more differently, almost like there was no 
pause in the training whatsoever, whereas the other person almost has to relearn everything from scratch. So mental rehearsing, very powerful stuff. I don't know. I don't want to get too esoteric on you, but it's there. Now, the other thing that I've been preaching about over the last year or two is you just have to follow the plan once, just once. Follow the process just once. And in doing that, you have proven that you could do it. Then get the reps in and keep doing it over and over and over again. And as I often say, I'm not a tough love kind of guy, but if you can't follow the plan once, just once, then maybe you shouldn't be trade, okay? If you consistently abandon the plan, then maybe find something else. But most of us want to do it, so just do it. And I know it's kind of silly, but I'm, I keep thinking back to this. If you paid a kid to follow the plan, he could follow the plan. So you're smart enough to follow the plan. You just let you your emotions take over and you get emotionally, char emotionally charged. All right. So quickly, there's three things in trading, your mind, the methodology, and the money management. And what's really cool is if you get better at your stock selection, for instance, your money management is going to get much better because you're going to recognize greatness like we talked about earlier. And you're going to be willing to toss those stinkers out of your portfolio when they hit the initial, the uh, your protective stop. Just like the guy earlier, instead of nursing positions, he would have long stopped out of probably all of those positions. He'd be sitting in 100% cash and looking for opportunities. And there were plenty of opportunities in 99. If you get better at following the plan, then you're going to stick with winners longer term. You're going to get rid of losers out of your portfolio. So not only does your money management improve, but by catching more and more big winners, your methodology is going to get better and better. And through that deliberate practice that we talked about earlier, you're going to, you're going to be able to recognize that greatness. So if you boil it all down, pick the best, leave the rest. I know it's cliche. And then plan your trade. The great part is all of that can be done after hours. You have virtually unlimited time to do that. The better you're planning, the better your stock picking, garbage in, garbage out again, the better your trade is going to be. Then all you have to do, and I know, easier said than done, is trade your plan. Now, here's where you get better. Here's where the deliberate practice comes in. When you get through... You ask yourself, did you really pick the best and leave the rest? Go back and in perfect hindsight, and not enough time to go through all the details, but obviously look at the sector, make sure the sector was trending, look at other stocks within the sector, see if you could find something better, and of course confirm that the overall market was trending or at least making a transition in trend when you took the trade. That post-mortem is where you get better. That's the deliberate practice. That's a secret, one of the secrets. To that, read Malcolm Gladwell on that. I saw a guy in the street the other day. Well, he was actually in a restaurant. He could have been Malcolm Gladwell, but 10 years younger. I almost like introduced myself. I'm like, ah, that's probably not him. He looks a little young. Anyway, that was on Sunday. But uh, Malcolm Gladwell's written about it. Uh, Anderson uh, has written about it too. In fact, some of uh, Gladwell's research, I think, is based on Anderson. Those two kind of disagree with each other but i think they're more in agreement than they realize anyway do the post-mortem and then rinse and repeat all right like i said last week i've extended this or i'm going to redo it this week because last week i forgot to hit record so if you are ready to get serious over the next year this is what i would do get the stock selection course and that way Everything I just said, plus another 13 and a half hours of how to pick the stocks, best stocks. Learn how to pick the best stocks, pick the best, leave the rest. Now, it's one thing to talk about things in theory, but it's another thing to see it in actual practice. Now, that's actually 1030 because I reset the date on that. 
So anytime between now and Monday, oh, that's right, that's the right date. Anytime between now and Monday the 30th, I'll give you the trading full circle course and one year to the trading service. That way, again, you can see it in theory, but then actually see it in actual practice. Now, there's no guarantees. Sometimes we could have a, a period of time where things don't work out, but longer term, Trend following works, provided, of course, you're picking the best going in using a solid hybrid money management approach. And that's why I wanted to throw in the trading full circle course in addition to the other one into the stock selection course to this. And again, it's another thing to actually see it in practice. So what you're going to see is the exact same things I talked about in the course you're going to, and both courses, actually. And you'll actually see, okay, well, this is where we're going to put the stop. This is why I like this stock. It's accelerating, persistent, nice little TKO, et cetera, et cetera. So just get the course. I see the order come through. I'll load you up with everything else. And then, as I preach, there's unlimited lifetime support on all that, okay? Be prepared to work, though. Be prepared for me to tell you to go back and rewatch a segment or two. But I will help you. I do stand behind everything I do. You guys know that that are here. but. In case somebody's a little newer to all this. All right, a couple of random thoughts before we hop into the overall markets. Uh, any questions or thoughts on anything I've said so far? Uh, I'll be happy to um, cover them. A couple of random thoughts real quick. Uh, I said this last week. There's this imminent top fear-mongering, okay? Predict early and often, I suppose. And if you've been around for a while, you've seen a reoccurring theme with me pointing out this fear mongering that happens. And it's amazing. The market is right around new highs, and they're like, it's a top, it's a top, it's a 30 year top, it's a major top, major top. And then the market goes up another 5% or another 10%, and then they're, it's a top, it's a top, it's a top. You know, predict early and often, I suppose. And then we have one little sell-off, one little knockout bar or something. And they're like, oh, that's it. That's it. It's in the world. I told you. I told you. And then the market goes up and makes new highs. Now, sooner or later, they're going to be right, but you can't trade off of that. You can't trade off of top picking. I mean, it's been one career that was launched for 30-something years ago in 87 because one guy called the top right before it happened. And then he's been wrong ever since. I don't want to throw anybody in the bus, but... It's kind of hard to be wrong for 30-something years and still be in this business. Now, but Dave, you talked about winter is coming over the summer. Yeah, because momentum was slowing and things were starting to look a little iffy. And my whole point there was to just put a shot across the bow and say, look, we're starting to see some signals here. We're starting to see some signs. Don't rush out and exit everything, but make sure you honor your stops just in case. And let's see what happens. It's a trend follower. Let's just continue to follow along for now. And then nothing materialized. So I think that winter has been delayed. But it's amazing the amount of fear mongering that's out there. It's actually positive for the market because trends exist as long as people fight them. So winter is coming, but not just yet. In the meantime, just be a moron and continue to follow along. All right, let's hop into the charts. Okay, Lenore, you're welcome. Thanks very much. Interesting points. Sorry to have to leave. No, no problem. I will have a recording for you this week, so don't worry about that. Let me get the charts pulled up here real quick. Talk about yourselves. All right, I'm going to go through the markets fairly quickly, and then um, we'll drill down to some uh, waiting for the um, charts to come up here. Where are they? Hello. Just give me one second. It's hard to find. These things sometimes with the screens like that. Uh, 
Okay. Oh, it bombed out. That's what happened. All right, I got it now. Ooh, nice little move in the uh, in the euro. See, I just made I just made an observation that I shouldn't have made. I should because it, it it requires me to make no changes in my position. So guilty as charged. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the SP five hundred. And you guys want to start asking about individual issues? We'll get to. Uh, as many of them as we can. I know I kind of went long today. SP 500, so far, it's just like a little bit of a knockout move. My big concern recently is that it did lose a little momentum, that net net thing we talked about earlier. But that doesn't mean you want to rush out and, and sell everything. It just means that, okay, I want to make sure I'm waiting for entries and I want to make sure that I'm monitoring my stops just in case. But longer term, you can see big blue arrow so far remains intact and I'm doing a piece right now for proactive trader magazine I wrote about daylight or I guess I can call it Dave light a couple years ago for them and I'm doing a piece now which is pretty cool and I hope to uh, it's due today so I hope to have it done but it's amazing if you put like a a 50 week moving average on the S&P 500 you'll be amazed that how much the, the daylight, meaning the uh, moving average, the lows greater than moving average, how that could have kept you in the market, on the right side of the market for a long, long time. You'd still be in this current little leg here since uh, spring of 2016. You would have rode out, ridden out this leg here for a few years. Go in and play around with that. It's just pretty amazing. Or just wait for the article if not. And I'll put it on my website once it's done. Anyway, longer term uptrend still intact. Just a little bit of a knockout move there. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ doesn't look quite as great, but it looks okay. So far, it just kind of ran up. You can see it did lose a little steam, wedged up a little bit. A little bit of a knockout move. Longer term, you can see that big blue arrow is still intact there. So no need to get too excited. You know, here's the thing with markets like, okay, well, where would I get concerned? Well, if it pulled back in below this prior little breakout, then you certainly want to pull your horns in. Let's take a look at the Russell. Russell looks pretty darn good. Kind of excited about the Russell. Reason I'm excited about the Russell is it had this god awful range for about a year and change. And as I often preach, the bigger the the base, the bigger the launch into space. So I think we're just in the early phases of a massive move higher in the Russell 2000. In fact, all these indices could end up in blow-off mode, but one day at a time, okay? Back here towards the bottom of the range, I wasn't so bullish, okay? That's when I did the winter is coming speeches. But so far, market's kind of hanging in there. Now, it is October. Seasonality is kicking in with a little volatility, so I would expect a bumpy ride. Now, I'm not going to go through too many sectors. Just a couple things to point out, like telecom breaking down in here. That looks a little ugly, okay? But then semiconductors, brand new highs, software right at new highs, longer-term trend attack. So most technology looks pretty good. Healthcare plans looked abysmal just recently, and now they're coming back with a vengeance. And this is why you don't want to go out and get crazy bearish on anything. <laughs> My wife called the Chinese place a while back. She was to try to get a delivery. They, I live in the country. They're not going to come all the way out here, believe me, but meet you halfway or whatever. She said, are y'all crazy busy? She, and they're like, no, we China house. It's like, okay. <laughs> anyway, that's, a, that's silly. Uh, banks up near new highs. Financials in general continue to do okay in here. Um, some people say that, uh, and I think it's probably John Murphy is where I read that in fairly recent times, but you can see bonds have been kind of weak as of late, banging out new lows, not the end of the world, but new lows. New lows and bonds mean what? Rates are going higher, okay? But rates are good for, for financials in general. That's probably why you're seeing those financials higher. All right, let's uh, open it up to some individual stock questions. You guys are waiting patiently. All right, John, let's talk about ESNT, ESNT. 
At first glance, this looks kind of interesting. Uh, I like the big base. What did I just say? Bigger the base, bigger the launch into space. So yes, I would like to see a little bit more pullback though. Now the problem is if you have too much pullback, then obviously you're back into the base, but it could have, if I'm looking for perfection, a little bit more pullback in here would be nice. The HV is a little low. I'm finding most of my opportunities in much higher HV stocks right now, but it's not bad. It's it's a decent looking uh it's a decent looking stock. A little wide and loose in here, but that's okay. It's basing. So I'll give you an okay on that one. Not quite a high five, but I'll give you an okay. <laughs> I'm looking at some of the early comments. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh FMSA. Now this one looked a little better a few days ago than it does now. Uh, let me look at the long, long-term chart on this. Yeah, it's it's close enough. Uh, with a transitional setup like a bow tie or a first thrust, I like I'm coming off of all-time lows, but this is close enough for government work because the most amount of people are going to be wrong when it's at major lows and the trend turns. Now, if we put the bow ties in, you can see that you did have a bow tie in here, and then the market has pulled back since. But the problem is it just keeps pulling back and pulling back and pulling back. So I would pass on this one for now. Maybe watch it longer term to see if it can get its act together and begin to take off again. But I would pass on that for now. And I hear you. Maybe a big bottom is in place or in the works, but it's too early right now. Dries, possible Phoenix. So yeah, that's a crazy one, obviously. Um you guys remember this one. What happened was the uh, they must have reverse split or something, but the uh, it came out that they was like 900% short, which is impossible. Obviously, some tomfoolery going on, and this thing melted up. Um, it's not going to go back to – this must be split adjusted. It's not going to go back to – I can't even – $16 million. It's not going to go from $2 to $16 million. Uh, I can't even get a decent chart in here. Yeah, I mean, we'll know it when we see it. Uh, maybe if it thrust a little bit stronger, a little bit past this high in here, begins to pull back, we'll see. But I would pass on that one for now. Look at your HV. It's 108. That's a little high. Every now and then I'll take a uranium or something with an HV over 100. But it's probably a little too dangerous. But let's check back. Let's check back next week. Let's see where it is. Okay. Zag. This is one I like. Um, I like the TKO move in it. It's got a lot of interesting characteristics. It's kind of wide and loose in the past. But if you zoom in a little bit, you can see that it's certainly improved upon recent times or in recent times. Nice uh, move higher. Fairly persistent one. TKO type of move lower. So I'll give you uh you know what? I, I'll give you a high five on that one. Good job, Donald. We have a lot of Donalds in here. GDS, the more the merrier. Yeah, this looks good. This is one that's on my momentum list. It's a little low in volume, but not incredibly low. It's a relatively new issue. So definitely put this one up. Who, who said this one? Carlson, good, uh, good eye on that. Uh, I'd like a little bit deeper pullback, but this certainly looks good. And you can see a lot of these things I preached about earlier today, it has them in it. It's got acceleration and trend. It's fairly persistent. you got a wide range bar or two in the direction of the trend. There's probably some laps. There's a gap or a lap right there. You can kind of put all the pieces together. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback, maybe a little bit, bit below 14, but it looks uh, it looks good. It definitely needs to be on your momentum list. So let's talk about TLT. Well, TLT is going to be the bonds. I'm not a big fan of trading something like bonds, at least via uh, ETFs, because the, the HV is really low. You can see not, it just doesn't bounce around that much. So it's tough to really make any money unless you're kind of leveraging up, which causes other problems because something bad can still happen. So 
I wouldn't trade them outright, but it looks like over the short term, they're in a downtrend. If you want me to do a little generic technical analysis, I think they'll probably find their low, at least temporarily, down around 117. So I think rates are headed higher, but I, I wouldn't bet, but it looks like based on tele technical analysis that it would, they would bottom out around 117. If they drop below that, then I think that we'd be in a lot of trouble. It depends on the, it depends on the uh, velocity of the drop. So if it if it blows through it, and then even if it stops shortly thereafter, I think that would scare everyone. It's the delta of the change and not the change or not the absolute level in and of itself when it comes to bonds. Q U R E rallied for 1830 entry. Thanks for the nice webinar. Thank you, Steve. Q U R E. I'm flattered that you're here. Uh, my only problem with this is kind of jumping out at me is this whole rally is just these two wide range bars. Your HV is 150. I mean, you could certainly do much worse and trade electrocardiogram or something. Let's measure this. That's, let's measure from this low here. Well, I could just eyeball it. It's, it's 100% run. Yeah, 100% run in just a just two, three days. So that's kind of has that bottle rocket characteristic I talked about earlier where stocks take off and then come all the way back in. So, yeah, just know, know what you're dealing with and then only trade it if it made like a deep retracement, like all the way to maybe like 14. But I would pass. This HV is just too too crazy. But, yeah, if you really, really, really want to go at, after it, uh, wait for a deeper pullback. JP, this is one that's been catching my eye. I like it. I like it now that it's pulled back a little further. I'd actually like a little bit more pullback. But I have to give you a high five on that, Arsony, because it it accelerated higher. It has wide range bars in the direction of the trend. It has strong closes, and now it's pulling back. Now, maybe I'm looking for perfection, but I'd almost like to see it pull back to about 18 or so. And if it did, I, I would say absolutely. Now, it's a little bit crazy. HV, almost 100. It did have a pretty serious run in here. So you want to make sure this, this knockout-ish move or this pullback is pretty deep on that. CWH, Donald and Carson both want to know about that one. You guys are trading partners. CWH, why is that not coming up? CWH, what am I doing wrong? CWH. Yeah, that looks good. Um, it's kind of hard for me to get excited about recreational vehicles, but I do remember years ago I made fun of Lululemon or Lemon Lulu, whatever they call that stock, and it went up about 40%. So this one's okay. My only problem after I kind of pick it apart a little bit is you can see that this pullback is sort of into the, the prior little base that it made here, and it did lose a little acceleration. But I think you could certainly do much worse. No, when you back the chart out, it looks much better. Yeah, I think this one's uh, plausible. I do. So, yeah, for both you guys, uh, Donald and Carson, both a uh, good job on that one. Since uh, Carlston's a client, I like I like Carlston's pick better than Donald's. How's that? Donald, you're not on the service, are you? <laughs> I have so many Donald's. CWH knockout is on a secondary secondary offering. That's okay. YRD. Yeah, I like this one. This has been on my watch list for a while. Is this a uh, Chinese stock? These Chinese stocks seem to be doing okay lately. Yeah, this is decent. Um, in an ideal world, I'd like to find something at a little bit lower level, but obviously with the market at new levels, uh, at new highs, it's hard to find. I'd almost like a tiny bit more knockout move, but it's definitely okay. It definitely needs to be on your watch list for sure. <laughs> Phil says that CWH stopped at guess where? The 50, right? Yeah, Phil is 50. 
You need to write a book, Phil. Phil's 50. I'm going to use a 50-day simple in the article that I'm working on. If I had time, I'd pull up the uh, chart for you. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. For IPOs, where do you put your stop? I accept MBIO in 13 ranges, stopped out of 10. That sounds plausible. I think I got stopped on that one too. Um, yeah, I did the same thing. You know, uh, it's tough. You know, especially with with now he's we're both we both took this trade, and this is where it's it's like an early breakout pattern, and it should not go back down towards its old lows. And I think that's about where I got out 10 or so on that one. I forget exactly, but this is the one. Remember earlier I said this trade was pissing me off. This is the one that was pissing me off. Now that you, now that you know, um, I think that. I mean, that's exactly what I did. I was in at thirteen and out at ten. So I think, uh, you know, and that's the hard part. How do you feel good about that? You know, but you have to. You, you know, you took a tr you took a trade that you saw, and then you allowed yourself to get stopped out. And then you just shout next. Or as I did, the, uh, if you listen to the latest podcast, I, in my best Paul Giamatti as John Adams voice, I said, I said good day. So Oh, you got it too. So it's three of us. <laughs> Donald says, I was thrown off the Mustang too. Yeah, nice little pun there. Well, measure those company. Well, shit, I thought I was the only one. Felt like an idiot. CIFS, CIFS, IPO Daylight. Yeah, look at that. Uh, if I could find the question again. Yeah, you know, good job on that trade. It didn't work, but, but see, that's the hard part is losing money and feeling good about it. It's impossible, right? Nearly impossible. Okay, I lost the uh, I lost the question on CFS. Oh, it's it's okay. Here it is. IPO Dave Light five day last month. Climatic today almost twenty percent above five day EMA. So let's put the EMA in there. Did you take the trade? I forget what my commission is for using uh, the Dave Light pattern. Yeah, Dave Light would have been what? Back here somewhere, right around there. Nice work if you did it. Sweet. Okay, uh, one question, please. Uh, when JP would be come down to 18, would you enter? Oh, okay, where would it enter? All right, let's take a look at it. Well, it depends whether it was like down. Well, let's let's just take that at face value. If it's down at 18, then maybe around. It depends on the high of the bar. Okay, so obviously we want to be. Let's say the high was 21. Well, at least above maybe like this high here. But see the volatility as such, it'd be like a 16 point. Uh, I'm sorry, a six point difference in the injury. So let's see how volatile it is when it pulls back. It, it, that's going to be kind of a crazy trade. Like XRF was one we were looking at yesterday, and we took it off the radar because it pulled back too far. But that was another one that was kind of crazy. We were like looking at it here, and it had a wide entry and a pretty wide stop. But what happened with this one is it pulled all the way back to its prior little breakout. So we decided to pass on that one. AKCA bow tie down. Yeah, that's one I was long, and that's one I stopped out at a nice little profit. And now it's bow tied down. You got to be careful shorting a. <sighs> shorten anything but especially a biotech especially an ipo even if you could get shares i wouldn't short that all right uh we've got room time for one more and i have to shut her down actually i should have shut her down about 20 minutes ago uh, but anyway yeah this looks okay uh who gave me this one good job uh you know ideally i'd like to find something a little in a little bit less mature trend but as a trend follower, you certainly can't argue with that. This is a double top knockout where you have kind of like a minor double top and a knockout move afterwards. Uh, in this particular case, I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback, maybe below 120 or something, but it lo looks pretty good. So I, I'm almost, I'd almost give you a high five on that one. But, you know, continue to poke around a little bit. Maybe see if you can find an IPO at this juncture or possibly something that hasn't gone as far. 
But as a trend follower, obviously, I can't completely argue with the uh, – or I can't argue with the setup at all. All right, look, my time is more than up. Uh, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Look for a banner ad on my website for the uh, special deal this week, and that's good until – Monday. Everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk again, any questions, David, Dave, Landry.com. Thanks everyone.